Well, welcome everybody to the conference, Contestations in Land and Agriculture, New Perspectives in Theology and Ethics. My name is Tim Howells. We're gathered here in person in the beautiful surroundings of Christchurch at the University of Oxford, but in a special welcome to our online audience joining us this evening. Welcome to you all. This wider conference is hosted by the Lodato C Research Institute based at Campion Hall and the McDonald Centre for Theology, Ethics and Public Life, both at the University of Oxford. And our thanks go to both those institutes. Contestations over land abound in our world today. In our keynote lecture this evening and in other events to follow at this conference, We'll be seeking to explore those issues by means of historical and contemporary geopolitical case studies and to deepen our analysis of the human and cultural values that underlie all those situations. Just a note, first of all, on practicalities. For those who are joining online, uh, there is simultaneous Spanish translation available. And I believe that in the chat now or in a moment, you'll receive instructions as to how to toggle over to that Spanish translation, should you wish. And at the end of our lecture, there will be a period of question and answer and general dialogue. So for those online, as well as those here in person, please do use the question and answer functionality on Zoom to engage with us at that point. Well, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over now to the moderator of our keynote lecture tonight, Reverend Dr. Frank Turner, who's a fellow in political theology and chaplain at Campion Hall at the University of Oxford, who will introduce and then moderate our lecture today. So, Frank, if I can hand over to you. So good afternoon to those of you here in the hall and to the audience online for this first lecture of the conference, Who Owns the Land? Belonging, Spirituality, and the Practice of Caretaking. Our speaker, Emmanuel Cotangoli, is Professor of Theology and Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. In the Keough School of Global Affairs, he's a faculty member of the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. He's also a Catholic priest of the Diocese of Kampala, and as the lecture will show, remains deeply committed to Uganda. Professor Katongoli will speak for an hour, and will then take questions for about half an hour. We end at um, 5.45. So as Tim said, questions can be put uh, from the hall and by those present online. Just one preparatory remark. Britons of my generation interested in politics will recall a strange, not to say somewhat offensive remark or linguistic habit really of the Prime Minister Harold Wilson. When he heard a suggestion in political debate which he thought irrelevant or beyond the scope of a pragmatist who had to run a government, he dismissed the point by saying, that's theological. I think we'll learn afresh in this lecture and throughout the conference that theology can have surprising and profound practical implications. So Professor Karangoli, we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Thank you, Frank, for the warm introduction. I hope what I'm going to say is theological. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, Celia, for really uh, the invitation for me to be here. You and your team, the whole team, um, for inviting me to, to come to uh, Laudato C Institute here at Oxford, and for all the arrangements, really, uh, Harriet has done an incredible job making, facilitating uh, my 
my travels, my, my, my coming here. So I'm, I have nothing but gratitude for the invitation, but also for the opportunity uh, to be here. I am at Oxford for the very first time. So what a joy, what an honor for me to be here. As somebody who was born and raised and grew up in British Uganda, <laughs> former British uh, protectorate in Uganda, we heard so much about Oxford as the apex of all learning, of all education. And a number of our faculty actually had trained at Oxford. And how we are not only impressed by their knowledge, but also by the precision, not only of their language, but also of their time management. <laughs> and they said they learned all that at Oxford. But what a joy and honor for me, really, to be here at this great center of learning and be immersed uh, for these few days in this rich, rich, tremendous history. It is really an honor as I've been walking around, just kind of stopping at different uh, colleges and buildings. I cannot but just be fascinated by the sense of history into which I am drawn just by being here. For the last seven years, I've been involved with an organization called Bethany Land Institute. It is inspired by Pope Francis Laudato Si. In response to challenges of poverty, ecological degradation, land degradation, and food insecurity in the rural communities in Uganda. And our goal is to form the young people, we are working with young people, to form young people whom we call caretakers into leaders for integral ecology. And the hope is that these leaders become the vanguard of a much needed transformation of the rural communities. So what I would like to do this afternoon is to use the story of Bethany Land Institute as a foil to do a couple of things. First, to reflect on the prob problematic modernity that accounts for much of these intractable and ongoing growing cases of land a conflict in Africa. Secondly, to highlight the kind of conversion that is required if we are to recover the health of both land and community in Africa. It is this conversion that Bethany Land Institute is leaning into even as we have not yet grasped or known its full potential. So, reflecting on the story of Bethany Land Institute really allows me, gives me an opportunity to share what I am learning as we are working with the young people in the community, what I'm learning about the gift of land and the human vocation to work and preserve the land that we get in Genesis chapter two. It also provides me with an opportunity to tease out some of the implications in the BLI caretaker formation program. For I believe that making explicit these uh, implications will deepen Bethany Land Institute's work as we, as we seek to become better agrarians, that is, people who care and work for the well-being of people and land together. I would highlight four vignettes in the story of BLI, four events, four moments, um, and that together will help me uh, to address the issues that I want to address that will kind of generate four themes. The first one on who owns the land, it's really a discussion about the conflicts that are undergoing, that are going on in Africa and many other parts of the world in relation to land. Second, I speak about the gift of land, and thirdly, 
about the spirituality that I see is underlying this caretaker formation program, and finally, about the ethics, especially that is connected to the story of Bethany. In the summer of 2012, I talked to a friend about wanting to purchase 10 acres of land in a community because I wanted to plant a forest. And the forest was to replace a forest that I knew growing up, that was near my home. When I was growing up, this used to be beautiful natural forest. It has all been cut down. And as a consequence, you can see how the crops look and how the land is now all bare. There was acute water shortage in the community. Uh, and as a result, a number of young people left the community and they have migrated into the city for better opportunities. Problem is that they never end up in the cities. They end up in these so-called informal settlements or slums where not only the challenges of poverty, but the ecological uh, footprints are so huge. You can see in this picture of many of these young people what I see. A question mark. Who am I? Why am I here? Who cares for me? Issues about identity, issues of community, issues of belonging. So I wanted to buy 10 acres of land in a way to plant a forest to replace the forest that I grew up in. Because I'd been fighting a lot of battles with the people who were cutting down the forest and I wanted to uh, use that energy into very uh, constructive, positive ways. So I started talking with a friend who actually knew a plot of land for sale, but he told me that where part of the challenge is also education. You have to educate our people to honor and care for the villages because part of the education system we inherited teaches us that the only way to develop is to go into the cities. The rural, the village is for the primitive people, for the backward people. So, and he said, perhaps you could join hands because he was thinking about doing a school. Then another friend, Tony, said, well, but you know, you don't blame the young people for going into the cities. They're looking for means of sustenance. Economics matters. Unless you build into whatever initiative you want to do an economic dimension, all the trees, all the forests that you plant are going to be cut down because people need to feed their families. Anyway, so we combine hands, we put together resources and bought some land in a community, 95 acres of land. Who owns the land? For no sooner had we bought uh, the land in the community than we ran into problems. First, there were some squatters that had to be evacuated, that needed to be compensated to be evacuated off the land. However, we soon found out that the more squatters we compensated, the more others came forward from nowhere to claim that they were tenants, so bona fide uh, tenants on this land, and they too had to be compensated. Then there were others that came and said, in fact, it was the very people that had sold us the land that said, well, you know, there was some irregularity in the way the transaction was handed and in the way the title uh, was done for the land. And soon there were two families that came forward and said, well, this is our ancestral land. One of the families approached us and said, well, we can talk. They needed money for their ancestral land. Another family insisted, no, the ancestral land belongs in the family. It can never be rented out. It can never be leased. It cannot be sold. But we had the title, who owns the land? 
We tried community mediation. Efforts at community mediation just made matters even worse. The first community, the first family actually used these community mediation efforts to demand more payment for their ancestral land. And soon some of the members of that first family would come to us silent and say, let's work together. If you work with me, I'll go over and talk to the other family members and we can settle this. In the meantime, the other family got into their own internal fights between the members of that family who wanted to sell their ancestral land and especially the clan leader who insisted that the ancestral land had to be kept in the family. We had the title, Who Owns the Land? The land in, this, in question is still in the courts of law. A number of things, a number of themes emerge in terms of uh, this uh, conflict. A number of things that I've learned in relation to this. I'll just briefly mention four that seem to be pertinent to the question that we are discussing today about contestations on land. The first one, is the growing phenomenon of land contestations. We found ourselves as one <laughs> incident of the so many land contestations underway. The number of studies that have pointed to the land contestation that are going on in Africa, the growing land disputes in Africa and in other parts of the formerly colonized world. This is not a time to go into all the details and all the factors that are contributing to these land uh, conflicts. All I can say that they seem to point to what I describe as a crisis within the unique modernity that is shaping in many post-colonial societies. The second observation I want to make is that this unique modernity is somehow connected, not only, but somehow connected to the multiple registers of land and tenure systems underway that often, many times, operate side by side. And this is what I found in terms of the confusion that there is in the Uganda land registry, for example. If you take the case of Uganda, there was no single land tenure system in pre-colonial Uganda. Varying systems of customary land tenure systems varied from one region to another. During the colonial era, the British, while keeping in place much of the customary land tenure systems, introduced three types of land tenure systems which were previously unknown. Milo land, freehold, and leasehold. British colonialists believed that community land ownership impeded individual enterprise and economic development. The introduction of freehold and leasehold tenure system was to encourage individuals into a tenure system as a way to develop economic development. Economic development being a key issue here. In 1975, Idi Amin issued a land reform decree that decreed that all land belongs to the public Republic of Uganda and must be registered by the Uganda Land Commission, abolishing the tenure land systems and also the different tenure systems that were left behind. In 1995, a new constitution was made in Uganda, and the Constitution Commission nullified Idi Amin's decree 
and recognize the four types of land tenure systems that were left in, pl in place by the British. Milo land, freehold, land tenure system, leasehold, and customary tenure system. The Constitution Commission, however, did recommend that customary land tenure systems be gradually phased out, not radically, but by way of encouragement so as to facilitate greater, quote, economic development and agricultural modernization. So you can see the kind of the confusion that in many places, these tenure systems are kind of operating uh, alongside one another. So a lot of confusion in the uh, land tenure system. The third observation connected with that, it is within this context that Uganda, just like many other African countries, are encouraging a number of land reforms. The land reforms, often sponsored by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, has been embarking on these land reforms again in order to advance greater economic development. However, rather than helping to solve the problem, the land reforms have simply compounded the problem, have simply created more confusion and conflict. Part of the problem is the land reforms assume a very modern and economic view of land. Land as property to be owned. Accordingly, in most of the land reforms, uh, the legal system addresses land, discusses land, mostly in terms of land ownership and land rights. For example, in 2016, Uganda set in place a land reform commission uh, that was headed by Eredi Bamgeire, who, in a way, in reading out uh, the mandate of the Land Reform Commission, and I quote mentioned, it is in place to investigate and to propose reforms for improving the efficiency and the effectiveness of the law, the policies and processes of land acquisition, land administration, land management, and land registration in Uganda the processes of acquisition, of management, of titling, the transparency of all that process. The fourth connected observation in terms of that, by assuming an essentially economic view of the land, the reform, in, case, in this case the Reform Commission in Uganda, misses a crucial cultural and spiritual dimension of land. For as Professor Mwambuse and Debesa of Makere University writes in notes, land conflicts in Uganda do not arise only out of multiple ownership claims, but also out of multiple meanings. According to Ndembesa, there is a difference between the definition of land and the meaning of land. To quote another sociologist, Betty Ocord, says, for many of my people, she's talking about many Africans, many Acholi people, for many of my people, land, I quote, means more than real estate. It isn't just a slice of the earth, which, one can, which can be farmed, inherited, built on, sold, or bought. In most of Uganda, land, equates to history, to heritage, identity, belonging, rights, and relationships. It creates social security and helps define social, cultural, religious values, and belief systems. When these values collide with the modern idea of commoditizing land, the people who live in and work the land suffer." End of quote. 
it's not so much about the definition of land that she's getting to, but the meaning of land according to most Africans. The overall conclusion from this discussion is that the modern land reforms in Africa are not simply a solution to the land conflicts. They themselves trigger and are the source of much of the land conflicts themselves. That is why, beyond attending to the growing cases of open land conflicts, we are concerned about a far more pernicious form of what Rob Nixon calls slow violence. The notion of slow violence, according to Rob Nixon, is the violence that many times goes on imperceptible, undetected, untreated. There's something about slow violence that is underway beyond the open land conflicts that we can see. And this slow violence has to do with a very modern exploitative and extractive relation to nature in general and to the land in particular. How do we move beyond this slow violence? How do we address this slow violence? Um, to address this slow violence, we need to move beyond reforms that just kind of focus on processes for more uh, streamlining land acquisition and policies to come to recover a more substantive understanding of land as gift, the gift of land. So what do we do? We had bought these 95 acres of land, we wanted to do an institute. In the meantime, 2015, Pope Francis had come up with Laudato Si. We are impressed by the argument that he's making for integral ecology, and especially in paragraph 111, when he talks about to kind of cultivate this, needs to be a distinctive way of looking at things, a way of thinking, an education program, a lifestyle, and a spirituality. I said, wow, this is beautiful, this is rich. And he said, we want it to be that education program. We wanted to establish a program that exactly does what this paragraph calls us to. We even secured some funding to build an institute uh, on the land, but we had no land, except we had a title. And the courts had uh, issued uh, an injunction not to do anything on the land. That is when the Bishop of Casanal Wero Diocese, Bishop Paul Semogere now, Archbishop Paul Semogere came to the rescue and offered by way of lease, a non-monetary lease, a cost-free lease, 49 years, of more than 300 acres at a parish of Nandere in the Diocese of Kasana Luero. He said, we need to do something in response to the, cry, to the invitation of the Pope to hear the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, and this initiative is so much needed, let's shift to Nandere. So we shifted from the 95 acres to over 300 acres at this parish in Nandere. As I reflect now about this gift of land and the geographical shift from one place to another of the campus, I see it as a metaphor. A metaphor that points to the kind of shifts that we need to make if we are to recover and live into this substantive understanding of land as a gift. If we are to engage a different relationship to the land. We at BLI are only beginning to realize these full implications of what it means to shift not only geographically, but to shift in our understanding of land. As I reflect about uh, this shift and that call, 
I see a number of uh, shifts that just the gift of this new land, the geographical shift to Nandere is inviting us into. First, it is a shift from entitlement to gift. A shift from viewing land as our property, as property that we purchased with our money and to which we had title to shift land as a precious gift that was simply given or leased to us. Not entitlement, but gratitude. Not ownership, but gift would have to be our primary and defining attitude to the land. Secondly, the sheer size of the gift required a shift in mindset from a mindset of scarcity to one of sheer abundance. If we thought 95 acres of land at Kumpa was such a big deal, we now had infinitely far more land that we needed, over 300 acres. Something about the generosity of the bishop was pointing to the promise of abundance and of productivity, not only of this particular piece of land, but something about land in general. Thirdly, a shift, a shift from an attitude of owning the land to one of belonging to the land. Nanda the parish, this parish, has a long and rich history. It was established by the White Fathers as the first parish north of Kampala to a land that was given the missionaries by the king on which they built the church, that church in the middle there, in 1890. The parish, as you can see, is also home to a number of institutions. They include a primary school, two primary schools, a secondary school, a minor seminary, a convent, and a clinic. The land also included a cemetery where the missionaries and a number of key leaders of the parish are buried. The land also included a natural forest that was planted by the missionaries. Now, this is the rich history within which BLI now locates itself and understands her mission, not so much in terms of development, but in terms of stewardship. The first shift has to do with a recovery, a recovery about this, this sense of belonging, a recovery of the traditional African native sense of understanding. For this sense of belonging, as Magessa rightly points out, is typical of many African native cultures, where a sense of belonging is inexorably connected to the soil, to the land. And the land and the soil in many ways serves as the umbilical cord of belonging, the umbilical cord that links the past and present, and the future, the spiritual and the mundane, the individual, and the community, the earth, the water above, the underworld below, that umbilical cord that makes all these connections. According to this African outlook, therefore, land is not just a dead matter, it's not just a resource, but it's a living and dynamic organism. 
indeed a story and a drama. The individual is one and part of this drama into which she belongs and participates and through which she discovers her identity as a member of a web of relationships that includes not only those living now, but future generations as, those, as well as those who have gone before, the living dead, and the ancestors long deceased. I think it's a similar dynamic sense of belonging that Pope Francis is referring to in paragraph 146 of Laudato Si, when he notes that for many native indigenous people, and I quote, land is not a commodity, but rather a gift from God and from their ancestors who rest there, a sacred space with which they need to interact if they are to maintain their identity and values. The gift of land, inviting us into all these shifts of outlook, if we are to belong into this gift of land. So my third aspect has to do with the developing an institute as we did the, the campus and so forth, the most challenging task that we had was one of developing a curriculum. We had already decided that we wanted to do to be that education program that cultivates the kind of integral ecology that Pope Francis is calling for. But what kind of curriculum would we have to develop that develop that spirituality, that mindset, that sense of belonging, that develops that ecological conversion uh, that Pope Francis is talking about, a sense of ecological citizenship that he calls for. So we consulted widely uh, with a number of experts in the different education programs. We had uh, workshops to kind of try to develop a curriculum that would bring together the spiritual dimension but also a practical training in sustainable regenerative agriculture, uh, a sense of economic uh, uh, empowerment on, on, on the land, we consulted widely. It was clear that what we were looking for was not just another training program for young people, but a program of formation. A program of formation into the mindset the lifestyle and the spirituality of a caretaker. We drew inspiration from Genesis chapter two, the story of God, God's love for the soil and for the land. God not only fashions human beings out of the soil, God plants a garden and gives human beings the vocation to work it and care for it. We wanted to establish a land-based initiative in the rural community that embodied this beautiful theological vision and also exemplified its promise that if we take care of the land, the land will take care of us and thus produce all kinds of trees, as the story of Genesis says, pleasing to the eye and good for food. Thus, we called the young people, we invited to join us caretakers. So we invited them to join us, called them caretakers. We shared as Laudato Si, we shared uh, stories from Bethany, and we invited them in a way to live in a new relationship to the land. To be sure, <laughs> we were not sure what we are getting into when we named our young people caretakers. We're not aware of the full implications of this name caretaker. Perhaps we still are not so sure. We still do not know. But there are a number of implications that are only dawning now on us that belong in a way that connect this notion of caretaker to the deep spirituality that is needed if we are to recover a new relationship uh, with the land. As I reflect about it now, I can see at least four uh, 
dimensions of this caretaker spirituality. That BLI is leaning into, it's not that we have fully grasped it, but we are leaning into in terms of these four uh, dimensions of spirituality. The first one is the invitation to be a caretaker is an invitation to learn to listen, to listen to the land and ultimately to God and oneself. For as Pope Francis notes, our relationship to land can never be isolated from our relationship with one another and with God. To recover what has been broken in terms of that relationship, Pope Francis suggests in paragraph 226, we need to recover an attitude of heart, one which approaches life with serene attentiveness. So working with land provides a great context and opportunity to nurture this attitude, to nurture this attitude of serene attentiveness. For cultivating the land is as much a discipline of listening to the land. According to the story of Genesis, the Lord took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it, using the word abad, and to keep it, shama. That is Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. However, as Ellen Davis notes, these words are ambiguous and often have double meaning. A bad, which is translated often as to work it, could mean work it or work for it, serve it. And shama, which is often translated as uh, keep it, could mean uh, to preserve and observe. Therefore, Ellen Davis notes, and I quote, it is to preserve and observe it, is to keep the garden and at the same time to observe it, to learn from and respect the limits that pertains to it. So the invitation to listen and observe the land, listen to and observe the land, is very, very much at odds with the modern production ethics that drives much of modern agriculture, which is driven by the maximization of profit. Thus, implicit in the name caretaker is an invitation to view farming not primarily as agribusiness, but as a form of husbandry, as a creative, quote, patient and increasing skillful love making that persuades the land to flourish. Quoting from David Orr. It is this creative love making that Father Godfrey Zamujo, the founder of the Songhai Center in Benin, also describes as entering into the dance of nature. And thus describes his work on the land with the young people as a form of contemplation and as a form of prayer. Like in Samujo, we at BLI are trying to do that, to contemplate the dance of nature, to enter into the way of nature and imitate the way nature works. Secondly, the invitation to listen to the land is at the same time an invitation to cultivate affection and love which arises out of and in turn helps to cultivate the patience necessary to learn to live and love a place. With the driving motivation of profit, industrial agriculture has no commitment to place. As Wendell Berry says, industrial agriculture has no patience with local love, with local loyalty, and local knowledge which make people train native to their places. That is why being a caretaker is an invitation to learn, to use the words of Wendell Berry, to think little, which Wendell Berry means to think locally. For Berry to think little is not a mode of abstract thinking, but a form of concrete engagement in a place, which is at the same time a way of coming to know a place. This is a particular kind of knowledge. And I quote, 
We are talking here not just about a kind of knowledge that involves affection, but also a kind of knowledge that comes from and with affection. A whole sense of affection. Gardening provides a great context and an opportunity to develop this form of knowledge that arises out of and is connected with affection. For as steam and steam note, in planting a garden, it is just as much about what one cultivates in the garden as what is cultivated within one. Awareness of the natural rhythms, seasonal patterns, affection, attention to growth, uh, tending the needs of something other than oneself, the desire to foster health of both soil and soil. End of quote. Thirdly, briefly, a third dimension of the spirituality that is connected to the notion of caretaking has to do with an invitation into non-violence. Industrial agriculture, Wendell Berry notes, is placeless, and as such does not distinguish one place from another and applies its methods and technologies indiscriminately. That is why, according to Berry, it is inherently, <coughs> excuse me, it is inherently violent as it forces agricultural localities to conform to the economic conditions imposed from afar by a few large corporations. Industrial agriculture, therefore, according to Berry, shares the same logic as colonialism. Vandana Shiva comes from a different angle to point to the violence inherent within industrial agriculture, especially in connection with the overuse of chemical fertilizers and pesticides, chemicals that were originally designed for chemical warfare. On refusing chemical fertilizers and pesticides on the land, and instead using compost and other natural and regenerative methods of uh, agriculture at BLI, caretakers are invited into a non-violent relationship with the land as they increasingly learn to see the land and all living creatures as fellow creatures in the shared citizenship. Finally, a question of healing, a dimension of healing connected to uh, this uh, spirituality. And here, I don't want to go deep into uh, the discussion, but I use Wangari Matai, the first uh, African woman Nobel laureate, the founder of the Green Bet movement, who provides an, a comparing argument about the need for healing. We are called, I quote, to assist the earth, to heal her wounds, and in the process, we heal our own wounds. For Matai, there is therefore an intimate, intrinsic relationship about healing the earth and healing our wounds. As she says, in grading the earth, we degrade ourselves, and in healing the earth, we heal ourselves. Perhaps one should add that actually it is not we who heal the earth, but in the very process of you know, tending, observing, preserving the land, we allow God to heal the land. For as it says in Chronicles chapter 7, if my people who are called by name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Yahweh promising. So briefly, let me also talk about the ethics. So again, very briefly, and how we are leaning especially into, uh, into Bethany. This is what I call a Bethany ethics. Uh, in choosing the name, it became very, very clear early on that we needed to call this institute the Bethany Land Institute. In uh, 2012, 2012, I had visited uh, the Holy Land uh, for three week uh, study uh, of the place called Bethany because of the stories I was hearing out of Bethany, whether it is Martha, Lazarus, Samir. I was just fascinated and trying to, wanted to find out what kind of place this was. And I did discover a number of interesting things about this place called Bethany in Jesus' time. First of all, the name says it very well, from two Greek words, Beit Ane, house of the poor. Then historically, 
realizing that this is where the poor, the homeless, the marginalized stayed. It's just outside Jerusalem, just a short distance from Jerusalem. But those who could not afford to stay in the city or those who could not stay in the city because they were, they were unclean, they all stayed in Bethany. And the most important detail was that this is where Jesus always stayed. He never stayed in Jerusalem. Even after making the Last Supper, made his way down the Kedron Valley and was going up Gethsemane, go up the Mount of Olives when he was arrested. He was going back to Bethany. But Jesus always stayed at Bethany with his friends, with the poor. What lessons that this has for the church in Africa, and I discussed these lessons for the church in Africa, standing within the ground, especially of the Bethany's of our time, these marginalized places of the poor. So anyway, we decided to call the program Bethany because we wanted to capture the sense of ethos and ethics that is connected to a place like Bethany at home among the poor. And so our programs have three main programs. They are all named after uh, Bethany uh, characters. Mary's farm. This is the teaching farm, demonstration farm, that trains caretakers into regenerative agriculture. Uh, but we call it Mary because it's Mary, when Jesus visits the home of Martha, that Mary is sitting down and listening. In all the biblical accounts where we find Mary, Mary is always at the feet of Jesus, listening. So we wanted to capture that, in a way, sense of listening, listening to the soil, listening to God, listening to our, our, our own lives, the sense of, 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 of formation in the process of uh, doing regenerative agriculture. This is one of our caretakers with her, her pig, uh, some animals, uh, crops on the land, and then the forest that is the base for an ecological education that we describe as Lazarus tree program. Because Lazarus, as we know, is the one who was sick, who was raised back to life. And so the ecology is dying in Africa. The land is degraded, is dying. How do we resurrect that? And so that ecological uh, program is called the Lazarus program that is connected not only with the forest, but also with a major reforestation effort in the community with a goal of one million trees by the year uh, 2050. Uh, here the caretakers are working with the school children uh, in a tree planting campaign and uh, ecological education as well. Every opportunity becoming an opportunity for ecological education, but also reforestation. And then Martha's Market, this interesting story of Martha. Jesus goes to a village, Luke says, called Bethany, and a woman named Martha welcomed him to her house. Who is this woman, Martha, who had a house in this village of the poor? And according to all the commentaries, un un unheard of during Jesus' time, that a woman would welcome a man in her house. Normally, it was the other way around. A man welcomed a woman in his house. So who is this Martha? I was really fascinated by the story of Martha, and realize the incredible resourcefulness and leadership uh, that Martha, uh, uh, in a way, played in her community, almost equivalent to the role that Peter played in the Patreon uh, community. So, but this is the kind of uh, leadership, uh, economic uh, di dimension of, of, of the program, uh, savings, there is already uh, uh, savings and credit uh, society connected with that, that is run by the caretakers themselves. Here they were at a meeting of that. And this Martha's Market is also the one that does with all the marketing uh, of, of, of the produce, the leadership, the entrepreneurship, the saving, uh, and all that. So let me conclude by a few uh, remarks, three remarks uh, that are kind of uh, lessons from, from Bethany of what I have shared. The first remark is about story. I have used the story of Bethany Land Institute in order to highlight the challenges that are related to the vision of land as property and to suggest new directions in the ethics and spirituality of land. I have used a story 
Because more than ever, we need stories. Data, facts, figures are important, but they can only do so much. For the challenge that we face is a challenge of imagination. It is stories that draw us into a new imagination and into new imaginative possibilities. But I have also used a story because we are talking about the story, the drama of land. Moreover, this story of land is part of a larger drama, the story of God's creation, God's love for the soil, and God's ongoing work of restoring all creation. As Paul says, God has been reconciling the world to himself. And as ambassadors of God's reconciling love in the world, we are invited to be part and to represent this ongoing story of God, of God's love in specific places and contexts. To do so involves learning to love a place, to live in a place. As Norman Wisber again and Fred Bansom uh, suggest, and I quote, Rather than being simply the absence of violence, reconciliation takes us to a physical place, to a plot of land that puts down roots, produces food, provides stability and hospitality, fosters healthy relationships, and inspires joy. Shalom presupposes people living securely in the land which means that the land and the people together are being respected and nurtured. Reconciliation takes us to a place. Story. The second observation I want to make is about a revolution from Bethany. To face the pressing ecological challenges before us, we need, as Pope Francis rightly suggests, we need a bold cultural revolution. I would have to see one, one, four. That revolution ran through Bethany. That revolution runs through the Bethany's of our time. These marginal, marginalized places. We need more stories and experiments taking place in the Bethany's of our time, the villages, places, which, even though they're not being fully drawn into the technocratic paradigm of productionist logic, yet still feel the assault of this paradigm with such devastating impact and effects. Here, in the Bethany's of this world, the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor are palatable. At the same time, I believe, it is in these places that you can notice the resilience and creativity that emerging out of these Bethany's of our time. And these resources, creativity, resilience, provide hope for the future. For again, as Pope Francis and many others have pointed out, the future, the hope, lies in small-scale production systems which feed the great part of the world's peoples using modest amounts of land and producing less waste. It's in paragraph 129. A revolution through Bethany. Finally, humility. Julia Adena Thomas, my colleague at Notre Dame, reminds us that the age of the Anthropocene presents us not with a problem, but with a multidimensional predicament. A problem, according to her, might be solved often with a single technological tool produced by experts in a field. A predicament presents a challenging condition requiring resources and ideas of many kinds. We do not solve predicaments. Instead, we navigate through them. What I have attempted to do here 
is to display one such engagement. And the final conclusion that I can make that emerges out of the reflection this afternoon is that humility is at the core of this task. Humility is at the core of this task. This is not simply because of the etymological connection between human, humus, and humility, as Norman Wisbach suggests. Not simply because humility communicates an overall orientation for daily life in which people keep the needs of others foremost in mind and heart, that is true, but because such an engagement, such a bold cultural revolution, in far as it promises healing for the earth and its people, will always remain small, humble, and humbling. But, as Wendell Berry suggests, in far as it involves love and affection, it is pleasing and rewarding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emmanuel, for that uh, fascinating lecture. I think you can stay by the podium to take questions, oh, okay. perhaps. Um, we have a a little short of half an hour for questions, both from the hall here. I see there's a roving mic there with Ashley, uh, and uh, from online chat via Tim Owls. As you know, by ancient British customary law, the chair gets the first question. Um, one of the things that was fascinating in the first part of the question was, the, the kinds of conflicts and contestations you analyze on a large scale, you experienced on a small scale. Um, it, it seemed big scale to us, but anyway, yeah, yes. small scale, I understand, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One striking thing was, because of the gift of land, uh, you, you didn't mention tensions in the same way in the second part of the talk. Correct. Uh, so this might have something to do with the particular history of this bequest. It was already church property and so on. But I suppose that raises for me the question of how generalizable is this model if there is not every community can expect a gift of hundreds of acres from a bishop? So how, how can you generalize? Because the, the larger the projects grow, presumably, the hotter the conflicts become. Yeah, that's, that, that's an interesting. I hadn't thought about that, uh, Frank. Uh, one, there were some conflicts also connected with this land, the new land, the gift of land. There were some squatters that had to be compensated, but that uh, went on quite, quite, quite smoothly. Again, because they were kind of appealing to different registers about land. Some of them had been on the land for 10 years, and uh, yeah, you needed to, they needed to be compensated. But that uh, kind of worked very well. The forests had been completely uh, entrenched on, and so part of the effort is in the reforestation and also reclaiming uh, the boundaries of the forest uh, because a number of people had come to cultivate that. So, but the conversation uh, went on, and the people, a number of the people in this part, did recognize that this was church land, and so they were able, with compensation, with the compensation, uh, because there is a new land decree from. Uh, the maybe five years ago, that any person squatted on the land cannot just uh, be told to, to leave. They have to be compensated for their crops and everything. If, if, even though somebody invited them to use the land and cultivate them, I think that also complicates the land. Uh, but the question that you're raising, yeah, this is a gift that was received, so how generalizable is that? Honestly, I don't know. I think there are a number of aspects that cannot be generalized about this. Uh, because I don't think everybody, anybody is going to get the same kind of uh, generous gift to, to do this program. Uh, especially, we are feeling that also in relation to our caretakers. 
we had made a requirement that to join the program, one would have to own or have access to a piece of land in the community because then when they graduate, they can go back and uh, cultivate that and become more of that. And more and more we're realizing that that is creating some problems because the number of caretakers now cannot have that kind of access to the land. So I think you, yeah, I'm not sure how generous that is, uh, but in this case, it, I mean, it's just an opportunity to reflect on uh, this kind of broader relationship to the land, uh, whether it is in terms of um, the listening to the land, um, whether it is in terms of uh, belonging to the land, or affection, or healing. I, I think these are generalizable. How one comes in contact with the land might be different, but these are generalizable, um, even though the historical context is very particular. Perhaps that's why I'm saying that we need more stories. Uh, I, I do like uh, models, I do like generalizable uh, models, but, but perhaps we need more stories to see how does it look like in other places. And whatever we do in it, it has to go that it looks like, not assuming that it's going to be this way. I, I think this is a kind of new, actually, part of the new relationship that is involving, inviting us. If we live in just kind of generalizable models, we are going to go back, I feel, to the technocratic paradigm that has no sense of place or time, that as Wendell Berry says, is placeless, it applies the same logic regardless. So there is something particular about land that we are getting to here, and uh, that has to put uh, breaks on our desire for generalizability, uh, that, that's kind of inviting us into a different kind of logic of particularity of, uh, yeah. I, I guess the whole of my argument is kind of moving a little bit uh, at odds with the, the generalizable logic of, of a, Industrial agriculture. Anyway, that, yeah. But I never, I hadn't thought about that. Thank, thank, thank you. So, questions from the board here, perhaps. There's a question from the back. Thank you, uh, Father Katongalai, for that, um, that wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the community of those who are working at the Bethany Land Institute. You spoke very eloquently of how it was a site of formation of students and other members of the community, and yet there are also sort of market gardens and clearly uh, a, a large community of people who are integrated into the work. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that integration, whether these um, people have um, land holdings elsewhere or there's a kind of common uh, organization uh, where they farm, they farm the land on their own in some way within the, within the 300 acres uh, of land that you, you all have. Or just if you could speak a little bit more about the sort of the life together and the organization of the place, the social organization of the place. Well, thank, thank, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, I think there are a number of aspects, dimensions to, to, to this. Uh, one, 2019 is when we shifted and started the construction of the campus. So the program, the formal program, has just been running for one year. So actually, this July, on the 29th of July, on the first day of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, we're going to do the formal public opening of the institute, okay? So that said, Everything is a certain kind of experimentation about, 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 about this formation program. So our first uh, group of caretakers are really, some of the young men and women had been with us in the previous land. So we are learning from them as much as we are learning, we are learning, learning together. Uh, three, we did require from the very start that those who want to join the caretaker program have a piece of land in the community, whether their parents agree, okay, they have access to the land, where even as they go through the program at BLI, they are able to go back and tend to that piece of land with the hope that also when they graduate, they return there uh, and they become models, they become uh, leaders in the integral ecology for the transformation. They become teachers of others. So that's, that's, that, that's the goal. 
And uh, for now, all the caretakers that we have, those especially that are going to graduate in July, have uh, pieces of land. But it's already being drawn to our attention that the number of people, a number of young men and women who want to be part of the program, who cannot actually have access. So what are, what, how are they going to, to do? When they come into the program, each one of them is assigned a piece of land uh, as kind of their education plot, uh, they learn to uh, cultivate that, whatever the lesson they're getting from the classrooms about soil mechanics, about uh, irrigation and so forth, they go and practice on the demonstration field, and then they go and try to implement on their plot of land. And they can grow whatever they want. And once the harvest time comes, they can sell that and put some of the money into the savings credit scheme. The goal is that by the time they graduate, this savings uh, scheme, they can have some of that money that may help them to acquire land, or they might borrow from that, 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 that scheme. So that's kind of the mechanism that is meant to help the caretakers in terms of acquiring their uh, own, 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 own land once, once they graduate. Um, but while they are on, in, in the training, they do have plots of land that are assigned to them that help, in a way, uh, them to get some income, but also to kind of begin to experiment with what they might do when they go back home. And at the same time, weekends and other periodic times, they go back and they have to take other caretakers to their respective places to kind of display what they are doing uh, in the community. So that is part of uh, that. The, the final part of the di dimension of that, is this Martha's Market, now that is, um, uh, 20 acres of this is dedicated to uh, the Mary's school, Mary's, Mary's farm. That's a demonst this demonstration part of it. And over 200 acres uh, to the forest. And the rest of the land is Martha's Market. So that is where the kind of commercial production uh, uh, takes place. And the Martha's Market SACO, that is the savings credit union that is owned and run by the caretakers, owns a part of that. It's a kind of a co-op, if you like, a cooperative, if, if, if you like that. So again, that is kind of a way to encourage a sense of ownership, but also a way to, for uh, the caretakers to generate some money into their accounts in the savings scheme. I feel it is still too early uh, to tell how it's going to work out, uh, what is currently is going to happen, uh, when the more and more young people want to come and they don't have pieces of land and they don't have enough money to uh, purchase their land. Uh, these are all kind of really uh, unknowns uh, uh, at the moment. And part of what I'm learning through this kind of work, that there is so much that is unknown. There is so much of it that is an adventure. There is so much of it that is uh, learning as, 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 as we go on. And, and perhaps this is again where I ended with kind of focusing on a story, a particular story, a particular kind of engagement. Uh, and that engagement, again, this is Wendell Bell also, think little. It's an invitation to engagement, even without figuring out how exactly everything is to work out. The learning to live in a place, to work at a place, to love a place, you know, it brings up all these different challenges but also different opportunities and dimensions that we may never even think ahead. Uh, what, one thing I can see uh, within this one year of formation is the change and the excitement that I see in our young people as they talk about integral ecology, as they talk about the connectedness to the land, as they talk about the citizenship with other creatures and almost kind of treating uh, the other creatures in a very Franciscan way as brother and sister, sister, sister snake. They were joking the other time. There was a snake in the, in the forest. They say, oh, I saw sister snake was, uh, <laughs> and so forth. So there is a, a certain kind of, but the most striking thing that, I, that I've seen is a sense of uh, dignity and, and agency. Uh, the, the, the kind of fire that I see in the, yes, we can actually uh, do something uh, to kind of create a new relationship to the land 
a, a, a new way of taking care of the land and cre creation. I, I find that is new. I find that is, especially there's some, a number of our caretakers that have come from very dysfunctional families. Uh, many of them maybe have dropped out of school. So there is a, a real serious question, sense of uh, who am I? Uh, where do I belong? But to kind of see that kind of sense of now agency and, and, and identity and sense, sense of confidence emerging, I, I think that has been uh, quite uh, confirming and uh, exciting for me just kind of even uh, to observe. But you, you're right, there's so many unanswered questions. Uh, perhaps this is where we need to be with so many unanswered questions, but trying kind of moving in what seems to be the right direction, even without figuring out all the answers to begin with. Thank you, so uh, let's take a question online and then Celia. Well, we've had a number of questions online, so here is one for you. Uh, Dr. K uh, Professor Katongale, what would you say to the argument that not maximizing productivity on the land via synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, other techniques of agricultural technology, is it, would itself be an act of violence to those who might therefore go hungry due to the overall yield? And perhaps you could index that to some of the type, uh, dichotomies you've given us tonight of uh, scarcity and abundance and so on. Thank you very much. Yeah, a whole question of scarcity and uh, ma maximizing profit. I don't know how many of you have seen Food Inc. about industrial food production. Uh, one of the lines that kind of strikes me actually at the beginning of that documentary, the way kind of food is produced in our industrial technological, uh, you know, one of the lines that strike me about that is when the filmmaker talks about uh, the cornucopia of plenty, the feeding of plenty that we have plenty and it's kind of the lens is walk, walking through an air of a supermarket and uh, there's so much plenty and variety. And then it comes down and actually when you narrow it down, it all comes to soy and corn. <laughs> so you know the kind of dazzling plenty, variety and so forth. There is that sense so. Or oh, is it really? Two, the number of uh, commentaries, I, and, I, and I want to see this kind of borne out in this experiment of Bethany Land Institute, the number of commentaries that I've, I've read, and I just read it here from Pope Francis says that actually, small scale intensive regenerative agricultural plots produce far more than these big scale production units in spite of the appearance of plenty. Vandana Shiva, in The Violence of the Green Revolution, the book called The Violence of the Green Revolution, does actually take that on, you see, that what the Green Revolution did is actually to convince us that unless we do this synthetic, unless in a way we bombard the land with <laughs> these earth bombs, the whole world is going to starve. I'm not so sure, uh, I, I, I don't think so. On the contrary, these intensive regenerative agricultural systems, I think are capable of producing enough to feed, not only we humans, but also to feed the soil. So we have a different starting point from assuming that oh, the only way is to do this kind of synthetic uh, enhanced agriculture. I, 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 don't, I don't think the premise is right. I, 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 I need to be, be born. But this is something that actually I am very, very much interested in pursuing and seeing uh, whether it is borne out by this particular experiment. And so we are trying to do that. And uh, the first year of corn and, and beans, everybody says it's not going to come out because you are not using synthetic fertilizers, you're not using uh, chemical uh, pesticides, and so forth. And Thank God we have a very, very firm director who has a master's in agroecology. Says, no, 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 let's do it the natural way with the compost and so forth. And lo and behold, our harvest was, was rich. And, and so if we can uh, you know, prove and more 
uh, of the farmers nearby can say, oh, really, you can do that? I think more and more people will realize that there's something misleading about this assumption that it's only uh, the modern industrial uh, production that is the way forward. Thank you. Uh, Syria's, Syria's next. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. I've, I really enjoyed that, um, that talk, thank you. Um, my, my question has to do with um, the, what I would call the implicit theology that's coming up to the surface now and then. The, the Bethany Institute itself, that's a very provocative name which sort of ties back into some of the biblical stories. And you mentioned Ellen Davis and Norman Wurzber as sort of exemplars, but what my, my question has to do with um, the theological education of those who are part of the Bethany Institute, um, whether it's more the sort of implicit um, education in ecological virtues, of, as it were, or whether there's anything more explicit in terms of trying to understand what, how their own spirituality or um, understanding of who God is has maybe changed through the experience of being part of the working on with the land in other words is there a growing another kind of growing as well as the kind of growing you're talking about um in terms of of the fertility of the soil is um not least because of course there are so many rich Af african traditions as well um, that are connected with the land and the and the life of the land so i'm just wondering how the, that's woven in or whether there isn't anything quite like that yet going on at the bethany institute um, as part of the, the story of the, of the Bethany Institute as well. So I'm just interested to fill that out a little bit more. So thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you, the, the, the theological uh, education. There is, of course, an underlying theological um, interest in this. This is done as a theological uh, e e e e experiment. The number of ways, in a way, uh, to comment to uh, this, this series of issues that you are pointing to, Celia. One of them, when we decided on that this is going to be a formation program, I think that was a commitment that we are making, that we are not just looking for a training program, either training in sustainable agriculture, but we are looking for a formation program uh, that kind of really uh, cultivates the lives, the souls of the people that are involved in the program and also cultivating the soil at the same time. But that kind of really required us to uh, make more explicit the kind of theology that is sustaining that. And that's where Bethany became very handy to talk about the kind of underlying theology. And so at every opportunity, we tell these stories from Bethany within the context, uh, original context, but also what that might mean for us in Uganda, in Africa now. And with each character, there are elements that are kind of drawn out. And every time the, the story is read, they are able to pick out some elements, uh, whether it is with the Martha, uh, the sense of service, uh, the sense of uh, hospitality, whether it is Mary, the sense of listening, the sense of intimacy, the sense of uh, gift as Mary anoints, for example, Jesus after Lazarus has been raised from the dead. So they kind of really you, you using this as kind of to get into the kind of ecological virtues of spirituality, of, 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 of belonging, these, these stories. Now immediate question came from people around us, but also from some of their caretakers themselves. So this is now at a Catholic parish does this mean that we have to be Catholic? And we said, no, actually, no. Actually, among the caretakers, we have, I think, two uh, Muslims and um, a number of uh, non-Catholic uh, Christians and so, and so. But we are sharing these stories that are kind of found in the biblical uh, story. I, I think they have a lot to speak to us as, as stories. But there is an underlying spirituality, and so the spirituality becomes the key. Uh, and one commentator actually recently said, 
there is, there is something going on at Bethany land. It's a kind of like religious. We, we, we don't fully <laughs> understand. But they are saying that they, they, they are not a church. So we kind of find ourselves in this kind of uh, place where we, yeah, the whole notion of spirituality, how do you really um, cultivate that without necessarily attaching it to uh, a very explicit, whether Catholic, uh, so these are kind of, a, I think, the challenges that we are navigating. But that said, we do require that a certain kind of atmosphere be kept at BLR. Uh, in terms of rhythm, for example, the caretakers wake up in the morning, 6 o'clock, uh, and uh, by 6.30 they are in the fields, and then they have breakfast, and they have classes, some theoretical and other practical. In the afternoon, they have lunch, they have uh, group discussions, and uh, at 6 o'clock, uh, they have prayer, common prayer. And that's mandatory for everybody. So we formed we <laughs> a prayer book for Bethany Land Institute that kind of trying to uh, incorporate some of these uh, elements. Granted that most of it is actually a Christian, uh, because that's that's the starting point. That's that, that's what we do. But it, but it's mandatory. Uh, so, yeah. How do you do a spirituality if you don't attach it to any explicit form of theological, religious commitment? That's that's. I think that's a challenge. Uh, I think in our day and age, we really like spirituality <coughs> without being religious. Uh, so, but that, that's that's the kind of the space that we are we are we are, we are living in as we are trying out. Uh, this uh, trying to get these kind of ecological virtues that, according to Pope Francis, really, this is is about a spirituality. When you ask these kinds of questions, uh, what does it mean to belong to to the land, to be connected to the land, to listen not only to the land, to oneself, but to God, however you conceive Him or her to be? Uh, there, there is that kind of uh, yeah, yeah. So we want to open up that space to encourage it. Fortunately, I think. For us, fortunately, we are grounded within an African uh, cosmology, an African uh, background, where being religious is not something embarrassing, or it is almost expected that there is a religious dimension. We may disagree about how many gods or the nature of gods, but uh, the sense of God, I, I think, for many uh, in the African context usually is, is, is appreciated, the sense of religiosity. So we're also trying to draw onto that, especially in relation to the land, we are discovering a number of connections, actually, with the, uh, what might be called African native spiritualities of belonging, as I have been uh, talking about. But you're right, there, there, there is, in a way, something that we are negotiating. Uh, maybe this is where Julia Thomas is helpful in terms of, we have, a situation, we have a predicament that I don't think it is, is going to be solved, but we are navigating it through the resources that seem to be available to us. And so a certain kind of creativity, innovativeness, uh, tentativeness is, 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 part of, is part of this work. I, I don't know whether that helps. Yeah. Thank you. We're coming to the end of our time. One perhaps very brief final question about public policy. Given the significance of this experiment, has it come to the attention of the regional and national authorities? And do they take, uh, do, are they supportive or skeptical? Yes, it has come to the attention of uh, regional and national, and it's going to come especially more so from July 29th. Because as part of the official opening, I think the office of the prime minister, maybe the prime minister herself is going to be in attendance, a okay. uh, number of government ministers. For now, we have mostly been flying under the radar in terms of the development of this. But from July, I think we are going to come more and more into the public national space. Whether that's going to be a gift or a challenge, <laughs> I think that remains to be seen. I think it's going to be both. Yes. But again, I think it's going to provide us with the new opportunities and challenges to navigate uh, the issues of that. I can see part of the uh, commitments that we have made, for example, uh, no to chemical fertilizers and so forth, is going to put us at odds with the, it's already putting us at odds with the main uh, orientation of agriculture in the country, with the policies of the Ministry of Agriculture. 
and, and so how we negotiate that, that is gonna be part of, of, of the ongoing, ongoing journey. Uh, again, as I said, Bethany Land Institute is an experiment. Uh, there seems to be something moving in the right direction about these aspects that I've shared that we are trying to lean into the care of the soil and the soul and the community together. It seems to be moving in the right direction. It seems to have the right sensibilities. The challenges that that is going to create, especially now as we negotiate these different audiences and constituencies, is going to be uh, part of our, our work. And uh, um, we look forward to see how that turns out. Also the impact of what this is going to make, how, how this will come out, uh, is yet to see our caretakers in, back at home in their communities and the long-term impact of that. So that requires a longitudinal study uh, that is yet to happen. But we kind of hope, it seems to be that we are bringing together the right ingredients uh, to kind of catalyze a movement that we hope will lead to the transformation of communities and individuals in such a way that we care for the land, but also we care for the community together. Thank you very much. And it, uh, it is time for us to finish. Uh, I think our online uh, attenders might be departing. Uh, you've answered questions very generously as well as a fascinating paper. Mm -hmm. Can we show our appreciation, please?